reactive training systems. So, uh, so we're here today with uh, Ben Escrow, Dr. Mike Zordos, um, talking about daily 1RM training. Um, so, so Dr. Mike, if you want to go ahead and lead us off and kind of explain your, give us your a little bit of your background. Sure. On Absolutely. Training with daily 1RM. So. You know, daily one-arm training is something that I think people have gotten to find out about throughout the last few years, which is a great thing, uh, but it's also often misused a lot. So the way I fell into daily one-arm training was certainly seeing others do it, and I, my first thought about this was, this is probably the dumbest idea of all time. And I think if you first think it's either really dumb or you think it's amazing, those are both appropriate responses. Uh, so. You know, I got into it and said, hey, you know, this is something that I want to try. And the first time I tried it, I didn't really see great results, but I didn't really commit to it. So then this goes back about four years now, I'd say, to around 2011. And uh, I really gave my all to it. And daily one around training is just as it sounds. It's not three days a week or it's not five days a week or just every time you train. It's seven days a week, day after day, consecutive days. And the way it works is working up to either an absolute max or just short of an absolute max. You really want to minimize failure. And then following that up with some sort of volume scheme. The volume scheme we typically use is either two or three repetitions uh, for three to five sets at uh, 85 to 90 percent of whatever you hit for the daily one around on that individual day. Now there's no doubt that this system works and we just completed three case studies uh, that we're hoping to add to the scientific literature soon in our lab at Florida Atlantic University. So the first ever study done on daily maximal training for the squat, and the squat is really what we're referring to. Um, there's no question that this will work, but we have to proceed with extreme caution. Essentially, I wouldn't rec uh, recommend this for anybody at this point. I think we have to answer a lot more questions first. But we need to understand if you're gonna maintain this for around 30 or 40 days or so, you're gonna see a pretty strong upward trend overall maybe five to 10% in your 1RM. However, we do have to understand that if we have a baseline starting, let's say this is 200 kilos, the first week or so, we're gonna have a pretty significant decline, maybe 10 kilos or so, before we begin to recover and break through. And over that time, even though we get stronger, there's uh, peaks and valleys, and peaks and valleys. And each valley is higher than the previous valley, and each peak seems to be higher than the previous peak. So you do have to understand the dedication, the time that it takes to get into this, which is why I simply could not recommend it for anybody, especially with other things going on in their daily life. It takes a huge toll mentally, it takes a huge toll physically. Is it effective? Yes. But how long can you sustain it for? What is truly the optimal volume protocol? Um, and then how do you come off of it and decrease your frequency and volume from something like this? And again, this is only something if somebody were to do it that would be recommended after many, many years of training and probably working up first to a max of twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, and, and then ultimately up into uh, a week of training. And typically we've seen it most for the squat, but I know it's been done for the bench and deadlift as well, and I'll let Ben hit on that. But that's kind of our model of daily one around training. Yeah, I, I don't really think, I mean, as usual, Mike covers it pretty um, pretty uh, in depth. Uh, so I think the only things I'd really add is, and I do think he touched on it, is just logical progression uh, from an individual who is excited and is very curious and ambitious and wants to add a lot of weight to their 1RM and thinks that this will be the way, which it absolutely will, um, but it might not be the most appropriate way. Um, so. People should follow a logical progression to something like this, and, and as Mike said, we do have a lot of questions um, that are still unanswered. Um, and I, I understand with the curious people, because that's what got me into it as well, is you know what will happen because there's not a lot of actual data on this, because it did come from kind of an anecdotal perspective with Bulgarians, and then, um, and then John Bros in America. Absolutely, um, he was my first uh, kind of uh, introduction to it. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, so basically, I, I think the big thing, the only thing I'd really add is just making sure it's a logical progression, not just jumping into something like this. For example, uh, let's say your frequency of squatting is three times a week. It's definitely not appropriate for you to do that immediately. Secondly though, um, not only from a frequency perspective, but also from a perspective of intensity, is if you're doing volume blocks three days a week and then going to daily maxing, that's a double uh, intensity jump for you, not just from the volume, but also from the high intensity. So. Uh, if someone was actually looking to try to implement some of these concepts softly, I'd say, it would be 
putting conservative maxes into their current frequency model for something like a peaking block before a meet. Because again, if you look at specificity, which you're going to be expected to do one RM in the meet, uh, you can take maybe a second attempt as a conservative max within like the last day. So let's say uh, day one you're doing 90%, or I'm sorry, day one you're doing 85, maybe day two you're doing 90, and day three you go up to a conservative max and then do your volume work after that. Um, for Again, for a peaking block uh, prior to a competition, not something that's throughout the year. So all the things that Mike talked on, touched on with periodization, uh, that would be one possible way to start implementing a point of the concept into uh, training. Sure. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, really, really two things to get across are just continuing on what Ben said is how to work up to it. And then I also want to talk about what to expect on a daily basis. But how to work up to work up appropriately. You know, as he said, if you're finishing a volume block, that's certainly not the time to jump into this because he said you're changing two training variables. You're changing not only your frequency, going from, let's say, three times a week to every day, but you're also changing your intensity from the lower volume, let's say, uh, RPEs in the more five, six, seven, eight range, sub maximal intensity in the 70 to 75% up into the higher intensity as well, along with the frequency. Also, if you were to do this, and again, I'm certainly not recommending it, but if you were to do it, I just want you to understand what you're getting into. It's high risk, high reward, right? So you do have that aspect, but also, Please understand that day to day, you're gonna see huge fluctuations. You might hit a huge PR one day. Let's say you started at that 200 kilos. You might hit, uh, let's say, 220 the next day, right? That's 20 kilos, 40 pounds. Uh, not the immediate next day, but at some point. Then the day after that, you might be down from 220 to 205. That's part of the process. Please understand that that's not a bad thing. Don't get discouraged and say, you know, on day 12, I hit a huge PR. Day 13, I was down 10 kilos, so I'm gonna stop this. No. The only way you get the huge days is if you put the work in on those days where you're much more fatigued because you have to make the adaptation, right? It's the old, Selly's old theory of the general adaptation syndrome or the GAS, the gas, right? Once you have an initial stimulus that you're unaccustomed to, your body has an alarm reaction and that's when you have that immediate drop off. But over time, if you keep putting the work in, you will adapt and you will recover and get to go ahead and make that progress and that's when you're in the stage of resistance when you can handle more training. Now it won't last forever and you eventually need to taper uh, and plateau so you don't eventually overtrain. You'll overreach and if you taper you'll get super compensation but if you overtrain you're down too far. So just understand those down days don't get discouraged. They are part of the process and the only reason you make the adaptations for the strong days are because you put the work in on the days where you have a drop off. So don't get discouraged with it if you do try to do this. Yeah, I'm actually just going to piggyback on that concept because that is, that's a huge point is that you're not going to feel great doing this and uh, you shouldn't expect that either. And um, to give a frame of reference for your typical training block, let's say you're used to doing 20,000 pounds of volume. And again, we'll use three days a week because I think that is kind of common in the powerlifting community. Um, you're doing a, a lift three days a week. Is I'm just going to draw on the flag here. Uh, what you're looking at when Mike talks about this undulation of adaptation, um, meaning performance is going to dip and rise and dip and rise. In a typical pattern with three days a week frequency, the wavelength is going to be much longer. Yes. So, meaning your performance will absolutely fluctuate because adaptation is not a linear thing, but it's going to be a couple days where you're going to see this uh, flux in performance. With something like this, because it's so frequent, it's every day, it's going to be a much higher frequency of fluctuation. So. As Mike said, you could have 10, 20 kilo changes, whereas in a training block that might happen once every three weeks. This could happen daily because of that. So again, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna steal Bros's um, analogy. If you work a manual, if you've never worked a manual labor job before, like laying brick, and it's the first week you're doing it, that's a huge now stressor that you're gonna be doing daily you're gonna feel like garbage. You're gonna get home, you're gonna feel like I got hit by a truck, and that's gonna happen for a week. But you bounce back. So same idea with this concept is, um, you're not gonna feel great, but it's going to give you performance. Um, it's definitely going to stimulate performance. And the last point I'll make is, uh, since it's very appropriate we're standing out in the sun, uh, I clearly have a very nice golden tan. Um, so how do you attain that? Um, but uh, the, I like using this, the skin tan analogy because it's a superficial way of us understanding adaptation. So if I stand out here in the sun uh, and I come out daily with an appropriate uh, dose every day, I'm going to continually get darker. If I stay out too long, I'm going to get burnt, I'm going to have negative adaptation. Same idea with, with the training is if 
when I'm this white, I can only stay out for five minutes or I'll start to burn. Same idea for an individual. If they're not dosing appropriate to their current training status, they're going to burn. Or, but the burn will be in central nervous system, so an internal burn, not as much as the superficial one. And so hopefully that makes... I think what you just said is you want the phone number of where I get my spray tan. So yeah. I can get that to you. Yeah. Um, we clearly actually both go to the same parlor. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, liquid it's, liquid sun rays. I think, um, I think it's I think it's looked like a ghost tan LLC. Yes. Um, so I just want to highlight the last point. I guess is you know Ben mentioned he was going to take uh, uh, Coach Bros's analogy, and I'm not. We're certainly not speaking for uh, yeah. uh, Coach Bros or for his gym, and I don't know you know all of their theories. I just do want to highlight though that I have a lot of thanks for their gym because I wouldn't even know about doing this protocol if it wasn't for watching them and watching their videos. So I certainly do not know if I um, uh, agree or if he agrees with my theories or not, but I have the utmost respect for what they've done. I just do want to highlight that this idea is not original to me. We, we've conducted the first scientific research study on it in our lab and hopefully it will be able to get published. However, I only learned of the idea because of him and I think that's such a cool thing in the community that we can pick up from everybody else these days. So that was uh, very inspiring. So I do want to highlight that. This is not an original idea uh, that Ben or I have or that, uh, that DeNovo has or RTS has. This is something that uh, we picked up from somebody else. So I just think that's very cool that, that we can learn from others uh, and, and hopefully uh, you know, we're able to make them proud in how we, uh, how we apply it here. But um, yeah, just understand what you're getting into if you do try to do it. Uh, it's definitely very demanding. It's something that only at a high, high training age uh, you should really, really develop into. That's all I got. Yeah, I, I think uh, my kind of icing uh, on it would be that <clears throat> if anybody is interested in this, uh, I would encourage anybody who's curious and likes finding answers, don't be afraid to try new things. Sure. Um, because that's exactly what Mike is talking about. Someone had to be the step leader. That's right. Someone had to, you know... Just make sure you're ready for it. Yep, exactly. Just make sure you're ready for it. And if you do, I guess the last point is, I lied, I do have something else, is don't, if you are ready for it, don't skip the volume. The volume is very important. Uh, if you're just doing the 1RMs and without the volume, it probably won't have the same effect. And also try to keep your volume to two or three reps at higher intensities. If you're trying to undulate, let's say, uh, undulating periodization type of volume using eight reps, six reps, four reps, two reps, it's going to create so much damage. And it's going to be very, very difficult to adapt because you're doing hypertrophy type repetition ranges and creating so much more damage on top of what you're doing. So keep the volume repetition ranges low. Don't skip it. Also, do understand, if you are to program this in, let's say for the squat for a month, it's going to be very difficult to train the other legs. Yeah. Yes, the squat doesn't necessarily affect the bench press, but typically I would do squat in five sets of volume. That's very time consuming, mentally, physically, um, just the, the whole way you're preparing for training. So to then also maybe you have elbow pain from squatting so much, to go and try and do the bench press effectively, your goal is to probably maintain the other lifts while you're peaking one lift in this way. Uh, I would probably cut out assistance work if you're doing any during that time, just to eliminate kind of excess damage and just understand what you're getting into mentally. If let's say you have a summer, you're in school and you have off and you're ready for it, maybe that's a time where you can try it. Um, but don't skip the volume, don't create too much damage with assistance or with the volume repetition ranges when you do go into it. Um, if we're done or whenever we're done, I gotta take the shirt off. It's embarrassing wearing this. We gotta somebody, end on that. That's me. it. Get me out of here. <laughs>